Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, whatever time of day you happen to be checking <laughs> us out right here on the Falcons Audible presented by AT&T. He's DJ Shockley, that's Dave Archer, and I am Derek Rackley back once again to talk about all things Falcons. And guys, we actually have some action to talk yeah, about on the man. field. Yeah. We have joined each other uh, a few times throughout the course of the offseason to talk wrap-up of last year, draft preparation, what are the Falcons going to look like this year, and guess what? We got a chance to see yeah, what did. they looked like this year. So here's a quick rundown of what we're going to be covering today. Of course, we'll look back at Atlanta's game against the Detroit Lions. Players who are standing out already. These guys are going to be a great resource because they're at practice a whole lot more than I am. So they can see not only what these guys are doing on the practice field, but how that transitioned over into the game against the Lions. Joint practices coming up. Mm. I'm sure we've all got various experiences yeah. with some mm. joint practices coming up with the New York Jets and then we will talk a little bit about the Jets preseason game so guys let's dive back into the Detroit Lions game it's what it's interesting because in preseason it's not necessarily about wins but in the NFL it's always about you wins and losses right you're some still somewhat judged by that but Dave I want to start with you how important is it just more 30,000 foot view that, that Atlanta starts off the preseason with a win, that the guys that were out on the field found a way to come away with a victory at the end? Yeah, I think you've got it's, – it's such a young team, Rack, that I think that when you go out and have success, obviously you're dictating that play to play or series to series, but if you can ultimately look up at the scoreboard and what you did from a workplace standpoint with all the guys coming together, you, you finished on top – I think that's a big deal, especially with a young football team. If it's an older team, you know, you wouldn't care that much about it because you know they're going to turn it on when the regular season starts. But this is a young team trying to develop a camaraderie, a culture, if you will, whatever, whatever, however you want to describe it. And so I think the winning part of it at the end, the dramatic fashion in which they won, getting a defensive stop at the end as well, um, that all stuff, that, to me, that's equity that begins to stack up a little bit. And I think for a young team, that's important. Yeah, DJ, the coaching staff is looking at a lot of things, right? They want to see reps. They yeah. want to see players in action. They want to see what we call live bullets, right? Quarterbacks are, can be tackled. Guys are coming down to the ground and everything. But you're still looking for, as a coaching staff, how players react mm -hmm. in situations. Mm -hmm. Football, as we know, is one of the biggest sports that's all about situations. How do you excel? That's why in practices, they get generally segmented out. We're working on open field. We're working on third and long. We're working on short yardage and goal line. But they also want to see, can players go in? Can we count on them to close out games? Do you feel like the coaching staff found anything out about that from the Detroit game? I think so. Um, just to piggyback a little bit on what, what Archer has talked about, I think it's big that you got to win because I think in the way you won. Mm -hmm. And you go back into a game, you say, okay, we won the game maybe because they jumped off sides and we got the five yards and we kick a field goal, whatever it may be. Whatever the mistake was that happened by them, that allow you to win. But this was a game that I thought – the Falcons took it to them to go win the ball game. There are a lot of things they had to overcome throughout the game. They had adversity through the game, and they found a way to win. So I think that's just as big as winning the game is how you win the ball game. And I thought they did that. And the other thing is, when you come into this game, I think the response of the team was huge. Mm -hmm. Like ours talked about, when, when, when you go in and you have to win at the end of the ball game and you have to overcome some stuff. Think about the first series of the game. They go right down the field and score. Mm -hmm. Your response, you go right back down the field and score. You had penalties. You had some long yardage situations. You responded to them. So this is what I think is big. Going into the uh, going into halftime, you get 47 seconds or something, you go down, you get a field goal. Those are big. Those situations you're talking mm -hmm. about, the end of the ball game. You had a lot of situations in this ball game where guys maybe messed up here or there and they responded the right way. Even in the, the drive where, where Ritter throws a touchdown, uh, maybe it's early in the ball game, you had Allison drop a ball, you had Hesse drop a ball. Yep. Those were two guys in that same drive who came up and responded. So I yep. think the response is what the coaches wanted to be able to see in this ball game with live action, with coaches not being on the field yelling at them. These guys responded in those moments, which were big. I think if you're you're an old veteran savvy quarterback, like a Matt Ryan, like an Aaron Rodgers, you maybe arch get to the point to where if a guy drops one or two balls, you may not go back in his direction. <laughs> but when you're a young quarterback, you're kind of tasked to just read the defense yeah. and take what's given to you. You mentioned the drop from Hesse, and then he comes back and he ends up throwing him a touchdown pass. Those are the things where it's like Desmond Ritter's just kind of looking at it and seeing 
Who is open? Where do I need to throw this football? I'm going to ask you this question, Arch, and I'm going to give you a choice here. I'm going to ask you either who stood, stood out or what stood out. Maybe it wasn't a player. Maybe it was a series. Maybe it was a situation. Maybe it was something bigger picture that stood out to you that you came away impressed with. Well, I think that the thing that's going to be obvious that jumps off the tape at you is the athleticism of the two quarterbacks. Mm -hmm. I mean, their ability to extend play sideline yeah. to sideline is yeah. a problem. Yeah. Okay, that's a problem for people coming up. Um, and both of them can do it. Both of them are intelligent runners. They know when to take off, when not to take off, when to throw the ball and to move, and both have the ability to. So that immediately jumps off the page at you. And obviously it's different because Matt was more of an was in an in-the-pocket in yep. guy, ball comes out on time. But it provides you, uh, at least for me, it provides me some excitement is that everything we know, everything's not going to get blocked perfectly. Mm -hmm. And most of the time it's not going to get blocked perfectly. If you've got a guy – a, an 11th athlete on the field that has a chance to do something like those two guys that immediately jumped off. And then I think we've been concentrating on the offensive line, their ability to create some creases mm. and to play on the other team's side of the line of scrimmage. That's a big deal when you can press the holes as a runner and you can slide to the daylight. And I thought we saw that from all the backs that ran and I thought all the backs ran really hard. Yeah, Dave, I'm going to, I'm going to agree with you because mine's more like, I guess it's a what and a who, but I liked the fact that, that and and I'll be one of the, I'll be honest I'll tell you that I feel like the offensive line still has strides mm -hmm. to make in the passing Absolutely. game but when I watch these two quarterbacks to directly to your point they give you options for when things break down. So instead of it being DJ second and 13, mm. second and 17, maybe it's second and nine. Yeah. That's a big difference sure. if you have Mariota or Ritter that can just get away from somebody and maybe they just get past the line of scrimmage. Mm. I'm not even talking about running for a first down here. But again, you change the play sheet for an offensive play caller when you're sitting at second and nine versus second and 17. Did anything else stand out to you from that game that you came away with saying, gosh, we got some promise there? Yeah, I, I would say the, the second year got a little of my man, Dorian Etheridge. I thought he was constantly around the football. I thought he was a guy that you remember last year made the team because of how he played in the preseason. Mm -hmm. A guy that showed up and, I mean, he's one of those type of guys that, that kind of, when you look at a stat sheet or you, you look at the ball game, you say, okay, 48's always around the football. Him and obviously one guy that, you know, we've heard the coaching staff talk about him during camp, but I think for the first time people got to see him, D. Alford. Yeah. He had the interception in the ball game. Uh, I think he might have led the team in tackles. He did. If, yeah, yep. So he, he did. was yep. he was a guy that you, you love to see because you know he's going to be a special teams guy, but also can be that third, fourth, fifth corner for you. You need him. And definitely, you know, took a step forward. Him and uh, the rookie as well, Ibikati. I, I thought, you know, he had a, a misstep early in the ball game, uh, lost a look contained, but then also – he came back later on. I thought he was a guy that was constantly trying to get pressure yep. and upfield a lot of the game. Yeah, it's I, interesting on that play too that you're talking about AK and it was the swift bounce and score yeah. in the first drive. I talked to Dean Pease post game about it, and that was not AK's responsibility. I thought the same thing. He okay. should have kept contain or set the edge in the defense. His job was to crush the edge of the line of scrimmage. The linebacker was supposed to scrape, and the safety had contain on the play. Mm -hmm. So the safety got caught up with some of the head faking. Again, learning during the game. Some yep. young players got yep. some young safeties in there. Learning and got caught up in some of the eye candy in the backfield and wasn't out responsible for Swift when he bounced and scored. Learning, learning process there. Dean said the very same thing happened later on the game, two-yard gain. Yep. And so you, that was what he loved about the fact that, okay, we made a mistake, cost us seven, but we, we learned and immediately applied it later on in the game and snuffed the play out and got off the field. I thought that was pretty important. A lot of times that ends up happening in film session when yeah. it's too late, but you have the guy's ability to make the in-game adjustments, and the coaches just want to see. Don't make the same mistake twice sure. or three times because, yeah. as you mentioned, it already cost seven points. Now, can we can we learn from those mistakes and grow as football players? I'm going to add one other – actually, two other guys. I thought Rashawn Evans got off to a good start early on in the Thumper. game. He was yeah. flying around, making some plays. And Kadri Allison, I felt, ran physical. Yeah. And I like to see that. You talked a little bit about the offensive line getting pushed. I liked how he ended up 
finding seams mm -hmm. and taking the ball upfield. That's what you want to see from running backs. A lot of times, the young ones, as you guys seen, they come in the league and they want to dance a little bit. You have got to find a way to get north and south in the NFL, even if it's just a matter of three you, yards. Real quickly, Nathan Landman played his rear end off too, mm -hmm. outside line, inside linebacker mm -hmm. played next to Etheridge. Yep. Those two guys were really oh, yeah. good. You mentioned Etheridge around the ball. Landman batted the ball down. In fact, he batted the ball that was almost picked off in the end zone mm -hmm. when he was coming on coming on a stunt. Um, Landman was outstanding. He's a he's a rookie free agent out of Colorado. They said when you throw his tape on, it's unbelievable in college. So they were lucky to get him as a rookie as a free agent. And then I thought Tyler Argier was as advertised. He ran with his shoulders square to the line of scrimmage, and he came downhill. And he had a lot more gas when he hit the line of scrimmage than I was gonna than I was willing to give him credit for. He got downhill and, and had some gas to get into that third level of the nice, defense. Yeah, he had a nice run about 15 yards one time. Was pretty and good there's going to be some DBs now late in games that don't want any part of no that. No part, yeah. Yes. So that'll be fun to watch as well. Yeah, DJ, I saw you got to do an interview with CP Unk yeah. um, for Daryl yeah. Patterson on the sidelines. And you were t talking to him about where does he see himself fitting into this offense. And I think – it might be a little bit of a luxury, again, assuming these running backs continue to develop because CP was kind of the answer last year. Like when they needed plays, when they needed the ball moved, they would find a way to get the ball into his hands. And maybe some of these guys that we're talking about step up yeah. and he can be used more as an athlete, not as just your traditional running back as yeah. he had to get used a lot last year. Yeah, so, I thought it wore him down. Right? Yeah, I think you make 100%. a great point. He had career high in rushing yards and receiving yards, career high in touchdowns. He scored 11 touchdowns. But he ran for over 600 yards, and you are, you're right. He was asked to be some of that batting battering ram stuff that I think that you know you'd like to see him in week 12 or week 13 look like the same guy worked right. looks in week one and two. And I think that that wore on him some a year ago. Yeah, still have that burst to be able to make some big yeah. plays for the offense. So I know it's been discussed by us and by by everybody else within the organization and outside of it as far as last week, guys. Let's let's turn the page and let's focus on this week. Before we get to the Jets preseason game, we've actually got joint practices mm -hmm. that happen around the NFL quite a bit. And so, Dave, let me ask you your your opinion. Like what? What do players get out of joint practices that they don't get when they're just going against black and white on the practice field right outside of this building? The first thing that comes off the page for me, Rack, and we all felt it because we all participated in these, is there's different juice. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's not game juice, mm -hmm. but it's in between practice juice and, and game juice, right? Oh, yeah. And so you get that. Then you also get the, a new look at something, something new. We all know. How many times did we talk about you're squatting on that route because you know we're running that route. You've <laughs> right. seen it all week in practice or no, yeah. three weeks of practice. You're not going to be able to do that here because yeah. you don't know their system. They don't know your system. So you're going to get a cleaner look, which I think benefits you too. It's much more of a game-style look. So you get a little bit of the juice, and you're going to get some of that game look that maybe is better than in your own practices. And there's so many times we've been through these before where you get in training camp and granted, I understand the times have changed and it's not as, as, as physical as you want to call it because they're not on pads as many, but DJ there's, there comes that time when you get tired of practicing against your mm. own guys, no right? No so doubt. that juice that I think Arch is talking about, not only is it the competitiveness, but it's the excitement of seeing somebody else, oh, no a different color Jersey and going out there and competing. Yeah. And uh, I go to an example I saw last week where you, you had the Broncos and Cowboys in joint practices. And I'm sure you guys seen it as well. And uh, Big Chubb comes down the line and he just lays out. He lays out uh, Ezekiel Elliott. I just thought that was like, that's what it's about. That's yeah. what happens is <laughs> you forget that it's a practice. You forget that it's just one of these periods where it's maybe third. But the juice is like, I just said, it get going. And you get to see somebody else who doesn't know exactly who you're about or what you're about, especially when you're talking about technique or certain things you're trying to work on. And you get in those instances, and it kind of feels like a game. It kind of feels – it's not all the way like Art says, but you feel like, okay, that's somebody different in front of me. Yeah. This is not my same teammate who we're trying to work to the same goal of getting better. I want to beat him. Yeah. And that's what happens in these joint practices is you want to make sure you put your best foot forward versus them because you know at the end of the day – they not on my team, so I don't, I don't care if they do good or not. <laughs> so to all the, the people that are watching, you got a few guys that have been through these joint practices before, and sometimes you say, are, are these practices better for specific groups than they are others? And I'll lead this off by an experience that I had as far as special teams go, 
And I thought these joint practices were great for punt team, mm -hmm. for punt and punt block, because mm -hmm. that is a big time competitive environment. Mm -hmm. Because in the NFL, you don't block punts very often. Yeah. But when you do, you, you the have game. the most athletic players in the world <laughs> that are going to try to block punts, right? So you drill punt block a whole lot more than you ever see it in the game, right? So I remember my experiences when we went up against the Tennessee Titans and we were doing punt block and you had another team over there and you know their coach was saying, guys, we got to get us one. Yeah. Like, we're going to get us one. And then from our side of it, like, this is punt protection. Like, we don't get punts blocked. <laughs> so there's an added level of focus that goes into it. You could call it competitive, so whatever it is, but I'll never rem I'll never forget how how fiery Joe D. Camillus was <laughs> when we went against the Tennessee Titans Joe and we D. were going punt block versus I mean our punt protection versus their punt block. And man, we probably went 15 reps. Normally in practice, you go about eight or nine, yeah. right? You get five or six with the first team, three or four with the second team. We went like 15 of them, two separate <laughs> groups, and they were getting after it. But that probably prepared me more than a preseason game, getting me ready for the regular season mm. just because of how locked in everybody was. Arch, do you see any other things from joint practices where a specific group, offense, defense, lines of scrimmage, one-on-ones outside that maybe get more out of this than anybody else? Yeah, and, and you just piggybacking, there's nothing more deflating than a punt block. No, you guys not. know that it deflates the team. Oh, yeah. There's some screwy number where 80% of the time you get a punt block, you lose the game. Yeah. So it's a, it's as important a it's unit a big deal, yeah. as there is offense, defense, I don't care what it is. Yeah. Your punt protection is as good as it is as important as it is. I would say if I was going to look at it, I mean, I think the wide receivers and DBs get enough work. Yeah, there's some nuances you can work on. I would think offensive and defensive line, this would be really important for them because yeah. you got different bodies that you, you don't know their idiosyncrasies. You don't know some of the cheat steps Ooh, that they take. And bring all that it kind out, Dan so, <laughs> Bring it out. So it becomes, oh, it oh. becomes even though you're not Maybe. knocking anybody to the ground, your landmarks have to be pretty solid. Your technique has to be pretty solid. Because, again, there's a little bit more juice. That guy's trying to make his team. You're trying yep. to make your team. And and I get it. It's happening here. But there is a little bit more of a brother-in-law scenario in our yeah. practices, yeah. especially deep into practice when you get two, three weeks in. Whereas here, this is fresh and new, and you can't cheat. And so I think that there's there's something to that. And I think an offensive and defensive lineman, I think they get a lot out of this. I, I love what Art said because, you know, in my mind, the trenches matter all the time. Mm -hmm. Of course, as you know, we're all skilled guys, so you know we don't say that too often. But I'm gonna go to the quarterbacks as well because you think about Arch talked about the fact of maybe you know a guy sits on a certain route or he he knows exactly what to do. For us as quarterbacks, we're all lo always looking at little tails. We got guys in practice who we've seen for two weeks straight. And we know, okay, I see his eyes lean. I see him leaning to one side. I know he, the safety's about to come down. So I can see that kind of stuff, and you know it. For a quarterback, he's getting a different look at an entire defense or look, yeah. a different look at secondary, the way they move. You know, some guys don't tip stuff as other guys do. You see him practice for the last two weeks. It's huge for those guys to not say, okay, I know this guy. I don't, I don't have to worry about reading my keys. Yeah. Now you go against these joint practices, and you have to go back to day one fundamentals of yeah. – if a guy goes in motion, you're just going to be mad. Or I know if this guy is leaning one way, he's going to be an outside leverage. Now you can't do that. You got to make sure everything is buttoned up. And it goes for, I think, every position too, but quarterbacks, especially especially in this part of uh, where you go on these joint practices. Well, it becomes a cleaner look for you for a quarterback. And I completely agree with DJ in the fact that you can't really cheat. So our our guys get to know our snap count. Right. Yep. They know yep. what we're doing. Even with the D-line or the re or they're trying to muddy the water in the back end, they know when to rotate late yes. and so you don't get a clean look. Now all of a sudden you got a team that doesn't know that, just like it would in a, in a game where they don't know your count. They don't know how you shift and move. And so you're getting a cleaner look. And so your ideas of pre-snap look are a little bit more guaranteed as they would be in practice. Yeah, right? that, that defensive end isn't getting across the line of scrimmage <laughs> a lot faster than what he normally does yeah. in practice. Go ahead. Go back to your point of talking about where you guys went 15 reps and all this kind of stuff. We forget now, yeah, it matters to the players. But it matters to the coaches too. Yeah. You think about Joe D saying, I'm not gonna let this guy beat me. Yeah. Like, or you think about coaches saying, Okay, I had all summer to work on certain things that I want us to be really good at, and now I got a chance to show it off. I don't wanna I don't wanna lose. I don't yeah. wanna, you know, not 
say that all my hard work this offseason didn't pay off. So I think the coaches have a little of that competitive juice as well, yeah. along with the players, too, because they want to win, too. That's why you say you go 8-9. But yeah. in this one, oh, no, nah, I got to get one more rep to beat that yeah. guy. So it definitely, I think, goes for coaches, too. This episode in part brought to you by The Home Depot. Everything you need for your next home improvement project is just a tap away on The Home Depot app. The Home Depot app digital toolbox gives you access to how-to guides, project calculators, and image search so you'll know exactly what you need to pick up. With the tap of the finger, you can rent and reserve the right tools for the job. Also, browse through millions of items from top brands that you can have delivered right to your door. Whatever your project, Find exactly what you need with the Home Depot app. Download the Home Depot app today. Did you guys get a chance to do joint practices when you were playing? Yeah. yeah. Dave, do you remember anything specifically oh, yeah. from the, yours? The that... Dolphins came up here. And okay. I'm talking about in the Dolphins' heydays. Yeah. Man. We're talking Dan Marino. We're talking Mark Duper, Mark mm. Clayton. Yeah. Mm. All those guys. Right. right? Mm. And so – I'm only in my first couple of years in the league. And so here's Marino, right? Marino's, I can hear him out there, Texas, Texas. You know, he's calling change of plays <laughs> and stuff like that. So they would have offense against our defense. We yep. would scrimmage against them. Yep. And it was on, it was in Swanee on the hill. Some people probably remember going yep. out there and watching, just like this setup is out here. Um, and so we'd have a scrimmage right there on that field closest to the hillside. But I found myself kind of moving over. Instead of being over with my offensive unit, we're talking through what we're going to do in the next series. This is what we're looking to do. All of a sudden, the coach is looking around for me. I'm the starting quarterback. I'm standing over there watching Marino with my mouth. Archer! What are you I, doing? I needed, like, uh, some some cotton candy or some popcorn. <laughs> I'm sitting there watching Marino. Marino's on the field. You, you know, know it's right. Uh, hey, Hall of Fame hey Archer, will you want to get over here and get the- <laughs> So that was that was the one that yeah. stuck out to me. I yeah. I got caught up doing uh, fanboy with Dan Marino. <laughs> well, <laughs> DJ, anything stick out for you? I remember uh, similar to how uh, Jacksonville was coming here. We went to Jacksonville. Maybe my my my, my rookie or second one one early years might have been. And um, I remember we had I had a couple teammates from Georgia on that team, uh-huh. and, but they were on the defensive side of the ball. So I just remember every time I came to the line of scrimmage and he played linebacker Tony Gibber, he would come up and he would literally just be talking about stuff we did in college <laughs> while I'm at the line of scrimmage. Shock, you remember that time we went downtown and you saw that girl? And I'm at the line of scrimmage. I'm at the line of scrimmage trying to focus, and he's talking to me every single time. And it, used to, it got me a couple times, I'm not going to lie. So it was, it was funny uh, to have that kind of, uh, kind of fun experience going against some guys you knew, and they were messing with you when they were supposed to be serious. That's and uh, and he was like a veteran. He was like, he'd been in the league for three or four years, so it didn't bother him at all. Yeah, Dave, you were talking about some of the guys that were there. You know, I don't know if I'd say as, you know, Dan Marino-esque, but that year that we were with the Titans, like – that was one of the first chances I got to see Steve McNair, like oh, up yeah. close and personal. Like I was a big fan of his in college, yeah. right? And then I watched him come out and just, he had this like low, but like in real control voice when he'd get to the line of scrimmage, it was like, ready, ready. <laughs> and I was just like, cause you know, when we had Chris Chandler and all this like really loud, like yeah. doing all this stuff. And Steve McNair was just like, it's cool and calm. Sicko. Right. <laughs> and then you just watch him like the strength he had in his arm. And that was the same. They had Albert Hainsworth. Mm. They had Keith Bullock in the linebacker position. He would never stop talking. <laughs> One thing we didn't mention, though, guys, and I don't know if it happened with you guys, but joint practices, there's a tendency some fights to break oh, out. Yeah. Right now, it oh, happens yeah. when you're with your regular team, but oh, yeah. because it's more competitive, you get one person that just holds on to a jersey too no long, oh, yeah. and then all of a sudden the arms start flying yeah. and the bows start swinging and you stuff. You can't be the one getting whooped out there, man. <laughs> Come on, everybody gonna see it on tape, man. But like, that's the dude we can pick on, yeah, right? Do that. Yeah. So uh, we'll see. Hopefully, they're able to uh, keep it somewhat clean and, and work with each other and get something out of it. All right. So that that's the joint practices. Let's let's move forward to the actual game. Game. preseason game number two I would say we talked a little bit about things that stuck out players that stuck out Dave what's something that you're looking forward to in this next one what's maybe the next step that you want to see in this team's evolution yeah I think you want to see guys start to solidify that they're the guy now mm-hmm. we saw some rotation at center there's still some rotation there Hennessy and Dahlman are trying to figure that out Hennessy started the game uh, and I don't know that was just because he was the kind of the incumbent or w- what the deal was. I think if you looked at the depth chart that the Falcons put out, it was kind of seniority based. Yeah. It wasn't really based on who was the guy. 
I think that Dahlman, there's a chance Dahlman starts this game at center. I think that there's there's some uh, there's some jockeying going on there, but I want to see guys solidify themselves. If Elijah Wilkinson is going to be the left guard, I want him to solidify himself yep. in there. Mm-hmm. Yep. And so, to me, this is because there's only three of these. I think you begin to solidify your starters in this game, and I think that you might even see guys play a little bit longer, yep. certainly yep. in this game. Um, and so that's what I'm looking for. You got accomplished what Arthur Smith was talking about. Arthur was talking about playing cleaner. He didn't have a lot of penalties. There yeah. were some, but not a lot of penalties. There yeah. were a few mistakes defensively that uh, Dean Pease talked about that cost them some points, but they also took the ball over, uh, took over the ball, and they also didn't turn the ball over in this game. So those things continue. That's gonna, how you're going to win. Yeah. If you're not quite as talented as the other team on the field, but if you're playing cleaner, it's going to give you an opportunity to win at the end. DJ, what sticks out to you? What's the next step that you want to see somebody or a unit make in this game? It's definitely a unit for me. It's that, that wide receiver group. Yeah. I know you don't have Drake London. So I want to see who are the next two, three, four, five guys that can solidify himself. Who can win? Who can create space in the pass game? I think Darby was the only guy who had two catches in the entire ball game. Everybody else had one catch. Yeah. Like yeah. I want to see those guys win on the outside. So there, a couple times, to be honest, the Cubes had to hold on to the rock. Yeah. And that's why they had to – you know, get outside the pocket and make some plays. I want to see guys win on the outside. And that's going to start in the joint prices as well. But I want to see that position in particular kind of stand up and say, all right, we got some other guys who can help Kyle Pitts, who can help Drake London. Who are going to be those other guys that we, we have seen in camp make some plays here and there? But can you do it versus somebody else? Yeah, and and you guys kind of talked a little bit about the offensive side of the ball. And, and we talked a little bit about it earlier and a lot this offseason. I'd like to see some more – somebody step up, more pressure on the quarterback. Mm-hmm. I would love to see something happen, whether it's from a scheme standpoint or just a player just decides to play on fire yeah, and I'm he go finds himself in the backfield on every passing play. Or it doesn't have to be one person, but somebody find a way – because I think that's one area that has to improve. We've got to find a way to make the opposing quarterbacks feel mm-hmm. more uncomfortable, get them off their spot, get the ball out of their hands quicker, and then throw – some of those passes that we can get tipped, that we can get the turnovers. Mm-hmm. I think it all starts with that pass rush. You got to make that opposing quarterback feel uncomfortable. I'd like to see more development there in this game. Who sure. is going to be the guy, or what is Dean P is going to find from a a package, a play calling standpoint that's going to find a way to get more pressure on the opposing quarterback? Love that. Yeah, Love no that. question. I wouldn't be surprised to see some of the guys that played in that second defensive unit like D Alford, mm-hmm. where D is going to get start getting some snaps at nickel, where you're going to see him inside some. you got the two guys outside in Hayward and Terrell. So you're trying to solidify who that back five is going to be in a nickel situation. I think there's some uh, – obviously there's some consternation as to when is Isaiah Oliver going to be available. Mm-hmm. Not available yet. Straight line run, yes. Side to side, maybe not quite yet. Uh, Mike Ford's been pretty good. But D. Alford now is one of these kind of guys. He might need to be on the field. He's a CFL All-Star from a year ago. Played for the Winnipeg team that won the Grey Cup. He comes in with a lot of confidence. He had little a, he little had light play, in the rear end. He had to play Nick close to you yesterday in the uh, practice did. at open at the open practice right on that sideline. Almost intercepted a corner right. I think it was over there. That's correct. Yeah, and then also climbed the ladder on a deep post route. He was folding back almost in as a had corner. That one. Yeah, came in and played. So he's got a little sense for the game, and these are the kind of guys you see surface. And so. Now solidifying where you're going to play. I think D. Alford's in that mix as well. Some of these backup linebackers, I think, are going to have a chance as well. And obviously, we want to see Troy Anderson on the field. I'm excited to yeah, see Troy Anderson. See, yeah, sure. Hopefully, we can get him back on the field this weekend. Yeah, yeah I mean, this is these are the times when the coaches are, are they're not only looking at how well are you able to digest the content and what you're seeing, but after that, like, can you go out and make plays? Right. Like, they just want to see who is not afraid to go out and make plays. Because it's real easy if you're watching on the sideline or you end up watching the tape, who is playing. And I don't know if scared is the right word, but maybe robotic, thinking too Too much, much, not reacting, not using their natural athleticism to go out and make plays. And you mentioned Alford. Like, I love the fact that he comes out and says, I'm confident. I play with this swagger. And talking about A.J. Terrell, giving him the confidence by saying, you've got the ability to go do what you want. Now just go do it, right? Mm -hmm. Sometimes you need somebody, somebody that's already on the roster, that's going to have a spot to tell you you're good enough to play and you can help us. 
And maybe that will be the little bit that takes yeah. him to the next level. So that's going to wrap it up. I know there'll be a lot more conversation here about the Jets practices, the Jets game. And guess what? I'm pretty sure we'll be back next week to break <laughs> we it all will. down for <laughs> yeah, you. Yeah. Make sure you like, subscribe, and review us on whatever platform it is you find our uh, podcast material, Spotify, iTunes, AtlantaFalcons.com, or YouTube. And thank you so much for joining us once again right here on the Falcons Audible presented by AT&T. Remember, that's DJ, that's Arch, I'm Rack. We'll see you next time. Take care.